I want to speak to you this morning about the subject of pressing forward. Um, sometimes we enjoy hearing motivational talks. Now the Bible isn't a motivational book in, the, in that sense of the word, but you find many passages in the Bible that really do motivate you. And as you read and study the Word of God, you'll find uh, times where you're greatly motivated as you get to understand more and more about the Word of God. And this particular passage in uh, the book of Philippians is one of those passages where we, we do find ourselves to be somewhat motivated. And we find ourselves encouraged because this is a time of year where we, uh, we do tend to be reflective and then we do tend to be uh, looking forward and we have plans and we have de desires and goals. And so it's, it's a good time uh, for us to uh, kind of be encouraged and uh, challenged in our walk with the Lord. So in verse 10, I like in the notes of verse 10 and 11, he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now verse 10 speaks about the fact that uh, the resurrection power of our Lord Jesus Christ gives us a sufficiency. Uh, you might go through this, uh, uh, this coming year and, and, and it's a good thing to realize that, that, that there is a wonderful sufficiency and Paul spoke about this sufficiency. He said that I might know him. But now he did know Christ. He, he had been born again. He was a child of God. He was a servant of God. But he desired to know him more, that I might know him. And so there is this desire, if you like, on his part to know something about the sufficiency that can come only through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it also speaks about a life of fellowship. Because he spoke about uh, the fellowship of his sufferings. And we're able to enjoy sweet times of communion and fellowship with God. And those are going to be the sweetest times in your life. But you know, the closer you walk with the Lord, the more he has his way in your life, the more you'll find yourself to be somewhat of a partaker of those sufferings. This, this vile world was never a friend to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you cannot expect it to be your friend either. And so, as you walk closer with the Lord, you find yourself to be somewhat, you, 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 you entering into that, the fellowship of his sufferings. And then he also speaks about being made conformable unto his death. And this speaks about the fact that you're able to live a life that is going to deny self and self uh, selfish ambitions and it's a life that's going to be seeking after the things of God kind of like what you see in the first, there's the second chapter of Philippians where, where the Bible says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God and uh, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation you're not feeling motivated quite yet, are you? Because you think motivational speakers tell you that you can do it. And you can pull yourself up by the bootstraps. But here's the thing. As a Christian, if you want to be motivated, it's going to be as you draw closer to the Lord. And you derive your strength from His resurrection power. And you enjoy the fellowship of His sufferings. And you will be made conformable unto His death. And you find something of an ability that you otherwise would not have had. So I want to talk to you this morning on the subject of pressing on. And uh, I want to encourage you. I want uh, for the Word of God to be a, a great source of encouragement to you today as you anticipate this coming new year. And perhaps you've failed in some areas. And the danger is, is when we fail that we and you're down, where the devil and the world and the flesh tells you, well, stay down. Look at you, you failed, and so you're not going to do anything. Uh, but I think we need to be encouraged that even though we may fail at times, that uh, we keep on pressing. 
in our Christian life. So let's read on from verse 12 and we'll read down to verse 16. He says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, for forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Let us pray. Our Father, we're thankful for your word. We pray, Lord, that as we take the time to consider this passage, that you indeed would challenge us and encourage us in our walk with you. We are, we are thankful, Father, for the great uh, men that have gone on before us. Their lives are recorded in the word of God. And we're thankful, Lord, that we can learn uh, something about them and we can... Uh, apply lessons to our lives that, uh, that they had learned. And so, Father, we pray that this morning you would indeed have your way, Lord. Would you open our eyes? Would you encourage our hearts? And, Father, we pray that you'd have your way in our lives today. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I think with each and every one of us this morning, there'll be two things that would be true of all of us. The one will be is that we have failed in the past. There will be some things that we shouldn't have done that we did do and some things that we should have done and didn't. And the other is that we will be somewhat dissatisfied with our spiritual state. I hope that's true. I, I, I hope there's no one here today that says, not me, I haven't fallen in the past year and uh, I'm perfect. So this doesn't apply to me. I, 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 hope that, I hope that you're not saying that today because it's a very dangerous place to be. Every single one of us, there should be a sense in which we realise we've not arrived in a sense where we can recognise our failures but, but learn from them and have a desire to kind of move on in our Christian life. Now these verses are very interesting to us because they're written by the Apostle Paul. And he was a man that God had used in a great way. You know, there was a time when he was an enemy of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a time where, where he did what he could to destroy the preaching of the gospel and to bring it to nothing. He, would, he made it his business, his job, his occupation was arresting Christians and throwing them into prison and forbidding them of preaching and teaching the gospel of Christ. He, he, his whole life was lived in opposition to Christ. But then we read in the book of Acts as to how on the Damascus road he had a wonderful encounter with the risen Christ. And, and that day his eyes, his spiritual eyes were opened to the fact that he was a sinner and that he needed salvation. It was on that Damascus road where he realized what a wretched, vile sinner he was and how that he needed to be born again. And born again he was. He was made a new creature. And the person that at one time had been the greatest opponent of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ became the greatest spokesman for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He went on to do great things. God used him to write most of the New Testament. God used him as a missionary to take the gospel message far deep into the Gentile world. A, a man that, that we could look at and say, well, if ever there was a hero of the Christian faith, this would be he, the great Apostle Paul. 
But he writes these verses and you can see the great humility of heart because he's not writing these verses as a man who, who knows it all and who has arrived and a man who has not fallen and failed. And a man who does not recognize his need for spiritual growth. No, no, he, he kind of lay, lays it open for us. So we get a glimpse of his shortcomings. And we get a glimpse of his desire to grow. So there are three things I'd like to share with you this morning. About Paul pressing forward. The first thing that we would see in our text is Paul looking over his failures. So we, we see this in verse 12 and verse 13. He said, not as though I had already attained, in other words, I haven't reached it and grasped it or arrived at it, either were already perfect. Now the word perfect in the Bible, you, you kind of, you can see in the context that it talks about two different things. Either it can talk about somebody that has Mature perfection often is used in the Bible to help us to understand ourselves as maturing, or it can be meant in the sense in which a person is perfect in the in the, the sense of the word whereby there is no need for growth. So Paul is saying, yeah, I don't think that I've arrived, and I don't think that I'm perfect. And then he says in verse thirteen, he says, and the same thing. I count not myself to have apprehended or laid hold of, but he says, this one thing I do, he says, forgetting those things which are behind. And I want to, we'll think about the one thing I do in a moment's time, but just think about the, these two phrases. He says, I'm not perfect, and he says, I'm forgetting those things that are behind. So it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you think... If ever there was a Christian that had all their ducks in a row, spiritually speaking, it would be Paul. If ever there was a person that didn't need to confess his faults, that had no skeletons in his spiritual closet, as it were, it would be Paul. He, he, did, he surely, if anyone had arrived, it was he. If ever there was a man who had no regrets, it was he. But this is not so. Paul says that he was, he's looking over his failures and he says, I've not arrived, I'm not perfect, and there's some things that I choose to forget. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? And his response here is a mark of spiritual maturity. The immature believer says, well, I've done nothing wrong. It wasn't me. We children do that, don't they? Who... Who ate all the turkey? Who had the last one's pie? Was it me? Well, you know, so children do that kind of response. I'm mature. I, I, I said it was me, Tracy. I ate it. You guys are still not laughing. <laughs> no more jokes. The mature believer says, I need it. I, I haven't arrived. The mature believer says, there's some things that I wish I hadn't done. There's some things that I, that I should have done. The immature believer says, no, there's, there's nothing wrong. So just for a moment, just think about your own walk with the Lord. Think about your own spiritual condition. What camp would you put yourself in? Can, can you look at yourself and say, there's some things that I, I, I wish I could just forget. And, and I'm not perfect. And I, and I haven't done all that I should have done. Are you in that group? That's a, that's a good group to be in. Or do you say, no, there's no, no fault here. I'm, I'm fine. That's a dangerous place to be in. Now the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The Christian that says, I'm fine. No problem here. You can look elsewhere. That's a pride and a haughty spirit. And that goes before destruction. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, Paul said, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. 
And Galatians chapter 6 verse 3 says, If a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. So it's a good place to be with the Apostle Paul and say, there are some parts of my life where I know I'm not right. And there are some parts of my life where I kind of wish I had a, a do-over. Some things I wish I could just forget. He knew that he wasn't perfect. But he wasn't going to allow his imperfections and his failures to stop him from trying. Too often we find that Christians fail and instead of just you know, getting up and continuing on and looking to the Lord and striving, they kind of just stay down. Paul was able to look over his failures, look over his faults, but it didn't keep him down. It didn't keep him down there. You know, and as a believer, and I know this isn't going to be the most encouraging thing, it isn't a matter of if you fall and if you fail, it's going to be a matter of when you do. You will fall and you will fail. But you don't need to stay in that condition. You don't need to stay down. There's only one person that's perfect and that's our Lord and, and He's in heaven. I'm not saying this to excuse ungodly behavior. I'm not saying this to excuse falling and failing. I'm saying that when you do, and you will, you don't need to stay down. That doesn't need to define your life. The Christian life is a life of progressive maturity. We are, we are growing. And sometimes we fall, but we continue to grow. Sometimes we fail, but we continue to grow. And Paul was able to look back on his life, and he was able to look over his failures. But his failures didn't define him. It's a good thing, really, to be mindful of where we fall and when we fail, so that we might learn from it. Now, you don't want to be in the place where you're always looking at your failures, because you want to look and learn, and then you need to forget those things. You don't want your past to define your present or your future. So Paul was looking at his past, but it was looking at his faults, looking at his failures, but he wanted to be a Christian that is growing. The Apostle Peter, he said in the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, he said that we need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and our Saviour Jesus Christ. That's a, a continual and progressive aspect to our lives. We all have our failures. We all have room for growth. Like Paul, it's a good thing from time to time just to look over our failures. But let's move on. Let's Consider verse 12 through to verse 14 again. I, I like you to notice Paul as he looks to be focused. Some people just love to look at the failures and they stay there, but Paul wasn't going to stay looking at the fails. He was looking to be focused. And so read it, these verses again, if you would. And, and I want you to take notice of the, the five very strong verbs that he uses in these two verses, these three verses. He says... And not as I had already attained, I was already perfect. But note the first one, he says, but I follow after. If, and this is connected, the word apprehend. If that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So the first verb is, I follow after. And then he says in verse 13, he says, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Then he says, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things that are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There are five great statements that Paul makes mention for us in these verses. He firstly says, I follow. And the word follow has the idea of pursuing. It's of, you could, you could think of it as a hunter trying to hunt down his prey. He, he follows the deer, he looks at the tracks, he follows, but he's following it so that he can apprehend it, so that he can catch it. 
Or you could think of it as a person that is uh, running in a race uh, and chasing after a finish line so that they can apprehend it. So notice Paul says, and he's focused on these things, he says, but I follow after. So there is a, there is a, a definite pursuing of a goal. And in this pursuit of the goal, this word apprehending, which is connected to the word follow, the word apprehending means to lay a hold of. He's saying, and it's an interesting way that the, the Bible uses these verses here, it tells us that Paul is saying, I'm, I'm reaching, I'm pressing forward, I'm pursuing after, I'm following this goal that I may apprehend it. Because, he says, this is the very thing that I was apprehended of in Christ Jesus. He's, what he's saying is this. He's saying, Christ got a hold of me so that I might get a hold of my goal. So he's following after. He's pursuing after. He, the idea behind this is that he recognizes that he has a purpose in his life. And so he's, he's following after. He wants to lay hold, he wants to apprehend that for which he was apprehended for. He wants to lay hold of that which Christ had got hold of him for. It kind of encourages us to realize that we've been saved for a purpose. Christ got a hold of us. So that we might get a hold of something in our lives. And so the idea behind this is that Paul is saying, I'm following after. And I'm trying to get a hold of this particular goal in my life. It's a great thing, you know, to be a believer and to live our lives. And to be able to say, I'm following after. I'm trying to lay hold of something. I'm trying to apprehend something. What a joy it is to have a life of service. You know, this time of the year, we tend to think in terms of how we need to declutter things. We, we, we accumulate a lot of things over Christmas time. Tracy thinks I'm a hoarder, and I've accumulated all these things in my garage. And then she looks at it carefully and she says, well, I can actually see your point here. Yeah? I can see why you've kept that, you know, that dead battery and that type of thing. But, you know, she, 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 she's starting to understand it, I suppose. But we, 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 at time to time we think, how can I declutter, make my life more simple? Sometimes when it comes to our service for God, we become so cluttered. There's so many different things. We've got so many fingers and so many pies and we, we make service so complicated. Service really should be so simple. Remember when, when Jesus turned the water to wine at the wedding feast of Cana? The words that we hear from his mother Mary to the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. That's simple, isn't it? Service. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Like Paul on the Damascus Road, when he met the risen Lord, he had two questions essentially. Who art thou, Lord? The first question. And the second question was, what wilt thou have me to do? We complicate service. We, but our really, our service should be focused on pleasing Him. Not pleasing another person. Pleasing Him. How can I please Him? And Paul was... He was following after this one thing. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to lay hold of this. This is my goal in my life. My goal is to serve Him and to satisfy Him. But that's the first word. He says, I follow. Then the second thing he says, and it's a great thing, a great statement. He says, he says this one thing I do. There's not many people that can say this one thing I do. We tend to be involved in, in many different things. But there is a great blessing to be able to kind of be like a specialist, if you like. Paul was a specialist. 
You think about an athlete. An athlete specializes in something. He's either a great runner, or he's a great fighter, or a great swimmer. But whatever it is that they find they're really good at doing, they focus all their attention and all their energy upon that one thing. They're great at running 100 meters. They're not going to worry about 10,000 meters. That's not where they're good at. They specialize in this one thing. And we would do well to kind of be more focused in our service. Now, this is difficult, isn't it, to say, uh, who, who amongst us this morning can say, well, I just do one thing? We do many things. But I think the way that we should approach this is all the various things that we do should kind of be zoned in together that there is this one thing, essentially, that we're doing. And whether it be your housework at home, whether it be your office work at work, or whatever you're doing, you need to kind of zone it in where you're able to say, this is the one thing that I do. So we should learn to be a specialist. You've heard that saying, it's actually a misquoted saying, where people say of a person, oh, he's a jack of all trades, but master of none. You've heard of that statement, I'm sure. That's actually misquoted. I can't think of who the president was in America, but this is what he had said. He said, he said be a jack of all trades, but a master of one. That, that's what we should strive to be. Be a jack of all trades, but be a master of one. And Paul, in his walk with God, he, he said, I, I follow after, and he was able to say, this one thing I do. And I think it was D.L. Moody who said, it's far better to say, this one thing I do, than to say, these 40 things I dabble in. So we need to be more focused. And Paul said, I follow after. He said, I, this one thing uh, I do. And then he said in verse, uh, in verse 13, the third thing he said, and we did kind of allude to this, but he says, forgetting those things which are behind. So what he's essentially saying in this, and it's a difficult thing to forget the things that are behind, but he's essentially saying, I, I'm not going to allow my, pa my, my past to dictate what I'm doing in the future or what I'm going to do now. And I think this is where many Christians fail, or where many Christians fall, because they allow themselves, they allow the past to kind of dictate as to what they're going to be doing now. Some unkind people are like that. You'll never amount to anything. I know what you used to be like. And so they, they want you to live being controlled by what you once were. Paul says, I, I, I'm not going to be dictated by what happened last year. Uh, he says, I'm going to forget those things. I'm not going to be brought under the control of those things. He's going to learn from them. He's kind of looked over them, if you like. But he's not going to be controlled by those things. So he's forgetting those things that are behind. You know, the Bible says that Fear. Fear is one of those things that really can, can really hamper a, a Christian in a great way. Sometimes Christians um, fear, they don't serve God as they should because they fear failure. And so they think that because I failed in this area last year or I've never got victory in this area, that that's how it's always going to be. They fear the failure. And so what happened in the past is kind of holding them back and it's stopping them from getting on. Paul says, I'm not going to do that. I'm forgetting those things that are behind. And then the fourth thing he says, he says he's reaching forth in verse 13. He's reaching forth. And the idea with this is like a runner who's running the race and they get to the, the, the finish line they're kind of straining themselves over. Have you ever noticed when they do like an action replay of a race and, and it's very close, two runners together, and then the one just kind of pushes his chest out just a little bit further 
or he just straightens his head out, but just to get over the line first. This is the idea that Paul is saying. Is he's not content just to get it to the finish line. There's this idea where he's reaching out with all that he has to, to win the race. He, he was not the kind of a man that was content just to finish. He wanted to finish well. So he's reaching, he's pretty reaching out. And then he says in verse 14, he says, I press towards the mark. And it's closely associated to this one as well. But the idea is that he has a goal in his view. He, he's, he's pressing, he's reaching forward to, to finish and to finish well. What a great encouragement he is. He had run well. And he wanted to finish well. We all know Christians that for a short time run well. It may be for months or it may be for years. And they run very well. And then something happens. And they fall out of church. And they fall out of fellowship with God. And you wonder what on earth went wrong. What hindered them? They, they ran so well for a time. Well, here's the thing. God doesn't want us just to run well for a, a time. He wants us to finish well. And you know the Apostle Paul, he finished well. In, in the book of 2 Timothy, he wrote this just surely, shortly before he actually was martyred for his faith. In chapter 4 and verse 6, he said, I'm now ready to be offered. He said, the time of my departure is at hand. I love the way that he speaks of his death. He says, I'm just moving out, I'm moving on, I'm departing, I'm near the gates, I'm going to board my flight, I'm going home. My time of my departure is at hand. And then notice verse 7, he says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course and I've kept the faith. Isn't that great? He, he was filled with zeal and a desire to serve but it wasn't just for a short period of time. It wasn't for a few months. It wasn't for a few years. It was going to be for the whole course. He says, I am going to finish well. So we see him looking over his failures. And we see him focusing, looking to be focused. And then lastly this morning, I want you to notice him looking at his future. Verse 14, he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You see that word prize? There was something that he was looking for. Can you see the motivation here? Do you ever wonder why certain people are motivated to do what they do? Well, he had, he had eyes to see what many people don't. He was saying, I'm just looking forward and I'm pressing forward by the grace of God for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He was motivated. Indeed, he was highly motivated to serve God. And so you and I may be motivated in different ways. But the greatest way that we can be motivated, and, and this is something that will keep us, even though the race may be long, is that we have this desire that we're going to be serving and serving well, that there might be this prize. And notice it says, the high calling of God. The calling that we've been called to, dear believer, is a high calling. If God has saved you, He's brought you up out of this world. And it's a high calling that He has for you. Paul realized and recognized that he had been saved for a, a particular reason. And there was a job to do and, and a, a service to perform. And so he had his eye focused upon this particular prize. He was looking forward to it. You know, I'm thankful that God... In his word, 
He doesn't just give us commandments. He commands us and then he tells us how he's going to enable us. You know, there's going to come a time if we live our lives faithfully and we're focused on serving our God as we ought to be, there's going to come a time when we leave this life, we come into the presence of our Lord and we hear these wonderful words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Well done. Those will be sweet words on the ear of the faithful believer. Far better than just hearing something like, Enter into the joy of thy Lord. No well done. No, no, no reward for faithful service. In fact, the Bible speaks of the judgment seat of Christ, the, the beamer seat of Christ. And it speaks about how Christians are going to be rewarded for faithful service. Paul had his eye on Christ. How that one day he would receive a crown. And here's a great thing. God enables us to do what we otherwise could not do. By the power of His Spirit, He enables us to serve. And then when, he, when we get to heaven, and we lay our hold upon that prize, the prize that we couldn't do in our own strength, only through His strength, He rewards us for doing what we couldn't do without His help in the first place. And we have that prize. And of course, we'll not hold on to it very long because we'll be casting those crowns at our Saviour's feet because of course He is the one that is indeed worthy. So this morning as we think about our Christian life, maybe just glancing back over the last year and mindful of failures and we're looking forward to the next year, I trust that we'll be motivated. That we learn from the past, learn from our falls and our failures, but we'll be motivated. That we would seek to be the kind of Christians that God wants us to be. To be the kind of servants that God wants us to be. That we continue growing and we continue serving. So may the Lord have his way in our hearts and in our, our lives today. I like what Paul said. He, he recognised that he wasn't perfect. I'm not, I haven't attained... I'm not perfect, but I follow after. And may the Lord encourage us just to press on by the grace of God. Let us pray. Our Father, we're thankful for your word today. We thank the Lord for the encouragement that you give to us. I pray that each one of us this morning would be encouraged.